Coach, I hope you're doing well, sir. Welcome to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Did you say Nick Saban's having a press conference? Yes, sir, he is. Wow. And when he changed. And, and, and when he when he says jump, we say how high here in Tuscaloosa. Just want to do. Wow. That's interesting. That's good stuff. Spring football, coach. Uh it's uh it's a big conversation here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh spring football uh is is good. Spring games are are bad. Uh don't put anything into a spring game. But spring practice is good. But uh, I learned a long time ago uh, don't even bother looking at spring game. Okay. All right. What, what you do in practice, what you've installed, you will not show in a spring game. Anybody that can play and help you win the championship, you get them out of the spring game. So I guess I coached in 14 spring games and every one of them is a total, total joke. But spring practice is good. Okay. All right. Well, let me uh, let me get a coaching perspective because you've known Nick Saban for many, many years. I'm just curious, can you help us understand what he's accomplished here in Tuscaloosa from a coaching perspective? Well, the fact that he got there uh, and what he started is not a surprise, really. Uh, I think the biggest surprise is that you can maintain it. And I think you only maintain it uh, by work. It's kind of funny. The the fact that you can maintain I tell people, I say, well, why can't Tennessee catch up? Why can't Tennessee uh, go beat Alabama? Because Alabama, because you got a new coach, doesn't mean they quit coaching and quit recruiting. And the reason people can't catch Alabama is he's never drifted away from the hard work it takes to get the players. And what people don't realize, Alabama, Alabama is number one in the country, in my mind, and getting top players not to transfer when they're not playing. Everybody else gets three quarterbacks to start pouting and leave. Everybody else has four tackles and one's mad and packs up and goes somewhere else. And if you watch Alabama, they get high quality people and the people do not leave. I think that's the key. Uh, I think that's the key to, to why they're able. Getting there is good and great. Staying there is pretty tough. And uh, that to me is... Uh, what's remarkable about what they're doing. He was with me for a couple of years. We coached together and uh, uh, hard work, uh, grinding it out, watching the film was always a strength. Did, did you, when you have a chance to see coaches come through as many years as you've been in the business, is, is the, the extra coaches, do they do something different? I mean, is it attitude? Is it, managing personalities? Well, Did you see something I, different in Nick Saban? I think if you were to interview him, the staff he was on, I guess we had, we had nine assistants. They not like today to win 25. I don't want 25 assistants. For every guy you had, you had 15 problems. Uh, I think he would tell you, they were all exceptional. They all went on, and, you know, there, June Jones was there. Jimmy Carr, the greatest secondary coach in the National Football League. Uh, Floyd Reese was there. Uh, uh, you know, the list of who was who. Uh, uh, and I had a, my, maybe the best assistant I ever had was a Doug Shiley. And Doug Shiley uh, uh, would always say, uh, uh, it's kind of funny how I got Nick. I got called by Tony Dungy. And, and Tony knew I was looking for a secondary coach. And Tony Dungy said, I was at a college campus, and a guy is coaching the corners exactly like Jerry Glanville. And I said, no. He goes, yes, I'm here watching him. I'm on the practice field. I goes, where are you at? He goes, Michigan State. And he's coaching full press bump and run exactly like Jerry. 
I goes, get his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I flew him in, interviewed him, and hired him. How about that? Wow, wow. Uh, can you share any old stories? I mean, we're always trying to learn more about Nick Saban. I mean, I've been covering him for, uh, this is his 11th year here in Tuscaloosa, and I'm always looking to learn more. Can you share us a good old story from going back to the Houston older, older days? Well, he probably did something. He, he did two things that, that really helped helped us that I probably wouldn't have done without him. We were a man-to-man, get after you. Uh, we were had to play Cleveland. Marty Schottenheimer was at Cleveland. Nobody in the secondary for either team, no corner ever got off more than an inch for six years. How about that? Our deepest corner was an inch from the line of skirmish. Uh, but he was the best I ever had at matching. For instance, he didn't want my right corner to be a right corner every day. He wanted my right corner strength and skills to match up with whoever he met. And he would, I would study the tendencies. I would study what I was going to get out of what formation I was studying. And he would take and study who he wanted to cover who. And so, uh, if you were the left corner today, tomorrow you may be the right corner or you may be in the slot because the guy he put you on, your skills could overcome the skills that you had to cover and win. It's Everybody wants to be a full press bump and run team, but I don't want to be a full press bump and run team if I'm not winning the one-on-one fade route, if I'm not winning uh, the post-corner route. By winning your... And he would match up uh, those things on us. And then I was a big 3-4 coach. And, and what he added to us, he had us, he added the 4-3. I coached the 4-3 in Detroit, sort of got away from it. When he came on, uh, we brought a down defensive tackle over the guard and played a 4-3 over and did things with that down guard that I had not done before. And we gave that we gave that down tackle the option to do things where the poor offensive guard had no chance. And I carried that to Atlanta when when he went to the, the on the Toledo. That that's another story. When he went to Toledo, you'll die laughing. But I, I carried that that down tackle with me to Atlanta, and and got got a lot. Probably got after he left me. I probably got. Uh, you know, five, six good years use out of out of that knowledge that he brought with him. All right, you teased me. Give me the story about Toledo. I'm I'm ready. He wanted to be a head coach, and I said, "Well, we got to find you a job." Well, then the University of Toledo came open, and he says, "I'm going for an interview." And I said, "I'm interviewing you four days in a row." And I would ask him a question. I say, "No, that's not the answer." He's going to ask this question. And then went back. I goes, "Okay, now this question." Well, he went off for the interview, and you would die laughing. He came back. He had a grin here from here. He goes, Coach. He goes, what is it? He goes, every single question you drill me on is exactly what they asked, exactly word for word. How did you know that? And I said, I got interviewed there 10 years ago, and they never do change their questions. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> and he ended up uh, at the University of Toledo as the head coach after for me, he went there, and then uh, uh, he went from there, I think, over to Cleveland with Billy Belichick. Billy Belichick was with me in, in uh, Detroit in 1975. So Belichick had been, Belichick calls me up and says, geez, I'm thinking about uh, Nick, yada, yada, yada. Well, I was with both guys at different jobs. When you, when you look at... Um... Nick Saban, and you see what he's been able to do. I still think there's several years left in the tank. I, I don't think he's any, any close to retiring. He's he, he, like 65, and he looks 55. I mean, he's he's drinking a lot of water or whatever, he, a great diet. Uh, but we, we still think there's five or six years left in the tank. Is it fair to call him uh, in there with Coach Brian and many of the other legendary college coaches? Uh I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, that's, that, that question it can be answered by uh, people that can't think. Uh, I, I think what he does is, uh, I was with him before the Tennessee game last year. We were together for probably a half hour, maybe 40 minutes, 
a half hour before kickoff. Now, here's two guys in a room by themselves with the door closed. He's going to play Tennessee in a half hour. And we went over three new defenses that we liked. We we went over a, a stunt that we could read the center. I, I mean, that never leaves. Uh, that's a guy that is still, and he says, what about this? And I said, what about that? And here we are still doing what we did uh, back in the 80s and still doing it every day. And and that's when you know it, it isn't going anywhere. It, it isn't going to change. Uh, here he's going to play Tennessee, and I'm on the grease board, and he's on a grease board, and we're drawing. Uh, that's not many like that. Coach Glanville, um, there's a college rule that is really not being enforced. The NFL rule is one yard ineligible lineman downfield. The college rule is three if they're beyond three, but they're not calling it. Uh, I want to ask you, because your defensive background, how unfair that is for the second and third level defensive guys when a lineman fires off the football like it's a run play, four and five yards down the field, and they hit those defensive back and those linebackers, those little passes over. How unfair is that for the defensive side of the football? I think the play that it uh, that it gives them a tremendous advantage is uh, the wide receiver screen, uh, the jailbreak inside. Uh, I see the wide receiver screen, and I see offensive linemen downfield seven, eight yards. And uh, I don't think you can get to heaven throwing the wide receiver screen. I think uh, Ole Miss tried that. I don't think you can win at all. But you can sure mess up the defense with it uh, by people being all the way downfield, and then the, the wide receiver screen cutting back inside. looks like a, I call it a jailhouse screen where they break back inside. Uh, it's illegal. Uh, I don't think officials ever know what's legally legal once the game starts. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, football officials. Uh, the, the pick on the, the slot, you lost the national championship game with a pick. Uh, is the pick illegal? Yes. Uh, uh, I was mad that we, I almost said we, Alabama didn't county the slot for the pick. So if they did pick I would never allow you to pick me on that because I figure as soon as I see that formation, that is a pick, so I'm going to put two on the slot so I don't have to go inside with the pick. Uh, you know, that's football. Uh, I, I used to stand, I, we were playing the Packers, I'd say the official. Do you understand when they get in the slot with the back there, that's going to be a pick? You don't understand that for the ball stat? And the officials would look at me like I fell out of Mars, where every coach knows that's happening. Uh, unfortunately, an official doesn't know that that's a formation with, well, Alabama lost the national championship on a pick from the slot. And did I know they lost the national championship before the ball was snapped? Yes. And Nick probably did too. How many times do you think Coach Saban has went back and he had two timeouts? Uh, I know if you call a timeout, you give the other team a couple of extra seconds. How many times do you think Coach Saban's went back and replayed that play in his mind? With them, if you see him, all you would have to say is on that pick, how come we didn't count the slot? And he'll know immediately who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> he'll know immediately uh, that was a rule. Never violated the rule, never broke the rule. Uh, is the play illegal offensively? Yes, but you can't count on them calling the play that is illegal. Like the lineman downfield. What about the jailhouse screen? What about the wide receiver screen? Can you count on the official... Uh, calling the lineman six yards downfield. No. So you have to defend it. Uh, so, you know, if I feel we're going to get a wide receiver screen, and, and, I, and I know Saban, I, I would immediately, uh, I would trap the corner. So the corner now is not going to go downfield on anything. You just chased me out of my man to man because I see this set, and I know this set's going to be a wide receiver screen. Boom. That corner is going to put his hand up, and he's a trap corner, and the safety better get over the top because he's got to stop the screen without getting run off or picked. It. These are things that happen that the average fan sitting up there watching the game, and and uh, I'm lucky enough that I I know what's got to happen to 
to be successful. And when you watch Alabama, Alabama, I watch and I watch LSU because I watch. I, I, and believe it or not, I watch Ole Miss defensive line. I watch LSU uh, defense play. Uh, there's very few places I can watch that I'm. I, I think that I'm getting a flavor and a tendency and a and an attitude of a pro team. And that's what I, Alabama. Uh, is not trying to make a tackle. They're trying to kill the guy with the football. Well, that welcome to the National Football League. <laughs> That's what the National Football League is. I'm not interested in watching kids that are being asked to get in on the tackle. That's college. And Alabama gives you a chance to see a glimpse of what the football is that I love. So, Is that, why, not, his, go is, ahead. Is that why his players are so successful? Uh, in the National Football League is is they've sort of been thir- through the 33rd franchise here in Tuscaloosa. No, it's why they're it's why they're well thought of before they get there. Because they are playing that way prior to going there. Not many people are. But they're playing uh m- more like Atlanta uh than anybody else is. Does that make sense to you? Yes, sir. And and I learned a long time ago, you only get what you demand. If the coach comes in and tells me, if Nick comes in and says, this guy's a self-starter, and he'll do everything we want tomorrow, and I always say, get ready for a heartache tomorrow. Uh, the, the rule is, every day you put your coaching hat on, you start over, and you and you say, they're not going to do it unless we demand it, and that's I, that, that's not going to change. I mean, that's that's the way you grew up. That's going to be the way it is. And if you don't give him what he demands, you're going to hear about it. And that's pro football. That is not college football. In college football, uh, don't holler at him because he's not starting. He'll transfer. In pro football, demand more than he wants to give every single play. Demand, demand, demand. Because you only, if he's giving you, if you think he's giving you everything he has, ask for more and demand more. 